Last week, the very first session, we began with the fact that the essence of all Yiras Hashem is knowing one concept, that Hashem is here. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, the great leader of his generation, told the Talmidim, Halavai, Halavai, that you fear Hashem as you do man, because knowing that Hashem is the creator of the world, knowing that Hashem made the vastness, the complexity is wonderful. And that's a very important way of coming to know some of the wisdom of Hashem. But this single cognition, knowing that Hashem is present right here, is the greatest life-changing, transcending concept that a person can come to. And as Ms. Sharma explained to us, Zuhi Yiras Aromamus, this is the highest level of Yiras Hashem. But interestingly, he also explained to us that that is the essence of davening, talking to Hashem right here. <clears throat> Little me, having a conversation with the Creator of the heavens and earth, but right here. But he explains that literally like I'm speaking to my friend, my friend may respond, may not respond, but I'm speaking to him right here, and that is dominating. And if you think about it, what you quickly recognize is that dominating is transcending physical boundaries. It's going beyond what my senses tell me, and tapping into a much greater wisdom. Intuitively, instinctively, I know things. And one of the things that I know is that Hashem is present, and when you daven, you further, further cut through the static, cut through the smoke in the mirrors, and you recognize Hashem is right here. And in fact, that again is the highest level of Yiras Haromus. We also def- <coughs> discussed the fact that Hashem is <coughs> the creator of all, and that is very different than any human creation. And we'll get involved a little bit in that in this session today as well. But today what I'd like to focus on is a very powerful concept that the Derech Hashem explains in the beginning. He says that you have to understand that as much as we focus on knowing Hashem, Vyadat Hashem, knowing Hashem is a tremendous mitzvah, it's the center core of all our avodas Hashem. But as much as we focus on that, it is physically impossible for human being to grasp Hashem. We can gain certain understandings, we can gain certain reflections, but to actually understand Hashem is way, way beyond any human being's capacity. What we're challenged with is relating to Hashem, seeing Hashem as much as Hashem reveals Himself, and trying to understand Hashem as much as we can. But at the end of the day, it's beyond human capacity to do. With that being said, and because again, it is a mitzvah of knowing Hashem, and it's certainly center core of everything we, we do, and what I'd like to spend this evening is some time on exactly this concept, trying to understand Hashem on a much deeper and much more fundamental level. And to do that, let me begin with an interesting pasuk, an interesting rishon on it. Bereshis bar lokim as a shemayim v'aretz, the very first pasuk in Chumash, in the beginning Hashem created shemayim v'aretz. The Safurno, one of the rishonim on the pasuk says, what does bereshis in the beginning mean? And says this for no literally, betchilas azman, in the beginning azman, vurega rishon, and it's the first moment built in Mishalak with nothing before it, shalohai azman kodim, there was no time before it. Says this for no, when you read this first Pasuk in Chumash, you have to read it properly. Bereshis baralakim, in the beginning, in the very first moment of time. There was nothing before this, and there was no time before this. At the very first moment of time, Hashem created Shemayim Va'aretz. And if you think about those words, they should be rather troubling. Because what the Surna is telling us is that at the first moment of time, Hashem created Shemayim Va'aretz. There was no time before that. Well, number one, we know that Hashem did many things before Hashem created the world. Number one, Hashem wrote the Torah. <clears throat> Hashem created many things. There was a lot of things that had happened before Hashem created the world. But even more fundamentally, Hashem existed before Hashem created the world. So how could the Surah say, at the very first moment in time, there was no time before that, at the very first moment Hashem created Shemayim Va'aretz, it's physically impossible. Hashem existed before then. Hashem did many things before then. So what do you mean at the very first moment Hashem created Shemayim Va'aretz? The Surah is very difficult to understand. And to try to understand the world that the Surah is bringing us into, I think we have to take our very first step in trying to relate to things beyond our frame of reference and beyond our capacity to understand. You see, we're challenged with understanding many things that my senses deny. 
We're challenged with understanding Ruchnius. <clears throat> We're challenged with understanding how Tefillin work. We're challenged with understanding how Torah affects my neshama. But more than anything, we're challenged with recognizing Hashem. And the Mesil Shah makes a very powerful point. All of my senses deny Hashem's presence. The way I relate to anything in this world, the way I recognize anything, is via my five senses. I see it, I touch it, I smell it, I feel it. But all of my senses deny Hashem's existence. How then is it possible for human beings to know Hashem? Bring it to your via data, and you should know. How could I know it when it's physically impossible and all of my senses deny it? And the answer to this question is we have to transcend our physical limitations and we have to come to recognize things that we can't see. Now, if you think about it, it shouldn't be that far into us. There are many, many concepts that we're very comfortable with and that we don't see, we don't feel. And yet we know fully they exist. If you're not quite sure that I'm right, just watch when a little child is about to take that key and put it into a wall socket. You jump. Now, you've never seen electricity. Electricity is a theory. Even lightning is really just burning off the impurities in the air because electricity is not visible. Even though it's not visible, you know it exists. It's very, very powerful. And when you get that shock, Good morning, America. Microwaves. We put a coffee in the microwave, a minute later, ding, it comes out hot. You don't see microwaves. You don't see radio waves. You don't see x-rays. Yet you know they exist. We're comfortable with many, many concepts that my physical senses deny, yet I fully know and am aware of. But nevertheless, when it comes to recognizing Hashem, it requires a further extension and a further transcendence. And to understand why it's so difficult for us to understand Hashem and really to understand anything beyond our frame of reference, let me give you a mushal. Imagine that Hashem were to create a flat world. Imagine Hashem made a world instead of the way we have with three dimensions, height, width, and depth. Imagine Hashem made a world with just height and width, no depth. And in this very, very flat world, Hashem made stick men, these stick men were tall, and they had width, they had no depth. And one day, two of these stick men are having a conversation. And one guy says, hey, Stretch, wouldn't it be amazing if we had some depth? You know, if we could be like fat, wouldn't that be amazing? His buddy says to him, Slim, I told you, there's no such thing as depth. We're just tall and we're wide. There is no such thing as depth. Now, that conversation would be indicative of a very interesting phenomena. These two stick people grow up in a world where there's height and there's width, but there is no depth. In their world, depth doesn't exist. For them to understand depth, they would have to literally throw away their frame of reference. Everything that they've experienced, everything that they know, they would have to ignore and be able to transcend and go beyond their limited experiences. In a similar sense, when we try to experience Hashem, when we try to experience anything that's spiritual, we have to transcend the bounds of physicality. We have to transcend our senses. But again, much like we're able to relate to microwaves, x-rays, electricity, things that my eye doesn't see, but I fully, fully know, and so too we can transcend these bounds of physicality. But again, the difficulty lies in the fact that my entire frame of reference, everything I've ever experienced, denies this. And much like Slim and Stretch, to have to imagine what depth looks like when they grew up in a world where there's just height and width, it's a very difficult and limited exercise, but nevertheless we have to do it. But to do this, we have to begin with a very healthy sense of humility. So let's begin this process of trying to better understand Hashem on some level. And to do that, I'd like to share with you a very, very significant and important question. And that question is, did you create yourself? Did you create yourself? Now, the Chobos of Ovos brings this as an interesting question. And he says, if you think about it, this is a mighty consequential question. Because if I created myself, then I am the creator. 
And if I am the creator, I owe nothing to anyone. I'm independent. I'm powerful. I'm in charge. On the other hand, if I'm not the creator, but rather I was created, then I have a very different relationship with everything, including myself. Now keep in mind there were people who assumed that they were the creator, Paro. And Paro said these words, Li Yori Vani Asasani. I made the Nile. I made myself. And apparently in some delusional level he believed it. So here's the question. Did you create yourself or are you a creator? So let's deal with that. So let's assume for a minute that you created yourself. Okay. So here's really the question. <clears throat> Did you exist before you created yourself or not? Now, <clears throat> if you didn't exist before you created yourself, you didn't exist, so you couldn't create yourself. LMI, maybe you did exist. <clears throat> so maybe you existed before you created yourself. If you existed before you created yourself, you couldn't create yourself because you already existed. And if this sounds funny, the Chavaz of Ovis says this is an important proof. You see, what it proves to us is one clear recognition that I didn't create myself. I was created. If I existed, then I could create myself. But if I existed, I didn't need to create myself. Perforce, that means I am not the creator. I was created. I didn't exist. I wasn't. Not just here. I, the essence of me, my neshama, everything, wasn't. And Hashem created me. And that clearly defines my relationship to my Creator. And the Mitzvah Sharm points out to us that that is the single most important question that a human being always has to deal with. If I was created, gee golly, why? Why does Hashem make me? Why does Hashem put me here? What's life about? What am I doing here? What does my Creator want from me? Why did He make me? What's life about? What am I doing here? And that question is the center, pivotal question of everything that you'll ever do. And thinking about this single cognition, that I didn't exist. And because I didn't exist, I couldn't create myself. And that means that I was created is a very powerful and important exercise in recognizing my relationship to my Creator. Hashem is the Creator, and I am the creation. But for our purposes now, there's a much bigger point here to this. And that is, we live in a world where many things exist. There's time, space, manner, energy. Here's the question. These <coughs> elemental objects, did they exist before Hashem created them? Was there time, space, matter, energy and before Hashem created them? So <coughs> again, the same exercise is going to show us something profound. Before Hashem created time, there was no time. And before Hashem created space, there was no space. Before Hashem created matter, there was no matter. And before Hashem created energy, there was no energy. And what that means in plain, simple language is Hashem existed in Shlemus, totally complete, totally perfect, without anything else. Anything else that existed didn't exist, but Hashem did. Time didn't exist, space didn't exist, matter didn't exist. Energy didn't exist, but Hashem did. And what that means is that Hashem is shalim, complete, total, without anything else. Even before there was time, Hashem was complete. Even before there was space, Hashem was complete. <clears throat> even before there was matter, Hashem was complete. And even before there was energy, Hashem was complete. And when you realize that, you come to a very clear understanding of Hashem's relationship to everything in the world. And if you'd like to understand this in more simple and clear terms, let's go back to understanding Hashem's relationship to anything in the physical world. Last week we gave a mushal. And the classic mistake that we human beings make is we think we are creative. I build things. <clears throat> I knock together wood. I build a shack. We think we're creative. I made something. The Nefesh Chaim explains that if I build a shack and leave it for 20 years, I expect it to still be there because I created nothing. When Hashem created the world, there was absence of anything. And from absence of anything, Hashem said, Vayhi, and He created everything. And if you'd like to understand Hashem's relationship to anything in existence, it's much like I to the seagull. Again, I'm sitting and waiting for the bus on a February night. It's freezing cold. I close my eyes and I imagine a beautiful beach scene. White sand, ocean blue, cloudless sky, 
One lone seagull gently wafts across the sky. The bus comes splash. Gone is the sand. Gone is the ocean blue. And gone is the sky. And gone is the seagull. I am the dreamer. As long as I dream about the dream, the dream exists. The minute I cease thinking about the seagull, it vanishes. That's Hashem's relationship to everything in existence. And before Hashem said Vayhi, there was absence of anything, zero, nothing there. Hashem was the creator, and Mishav, the one who created and maintains it, much like I to the seagull, Hashem is the creator and maintainer of everything in existence. But we need to understand one more step in that mushal, because I think it's very eye-opening. We discussed the fact that, let's assume for a minute, that in my dream, I see the seagull going east, and suddenly the seagull decides to turn west. And I say, no, 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 I don't want you going that way, I want you going east. He says, no, I'm going west, east, west, east, west. And we have a machlokas. Now, if you think about it, obviously that never happened. Why? Because, you see, I'm the dreamer. I dream about the sand, I dream about the ocean, I dream about the seagull, and anything that the seagull thinks is within my mind. I am the dreamer. He has no independent will. He has no independent das. He is me. I am him. I created him. I maintain him. And he has no thoughts other than my thoughts. And as we discussed last week, <clears throat> to allow for free will, Hashem created this very difficult to understand essence called independence where a person is given an independent das. I have a das separate from your das. <clears throat> Malachim have das. There are das nifrad, separate intelligent wills. And in our mushal, the seagull has his own das, his own will. But you have to understand something. He only has that will. And he only has the thoughts. And he only has anything going on in his brain, Kolzman, that I keep it there. Because granted I gave him the ability to think, but anything in my dream only exists because I'm the one keeping it there. So if he decides to go west, it's only because I am willing him to be able to think the thought west and stay with that thought. And certainly there's nothing the seagull can think that I'm not aware of because I'm the keeper. I'm the one who created the platform I'm the one who maintains the platform, and any thought that crosses his mind is fully revealed to me because it's in my dream. When you understand that, you understand a very fundamental concept, and that is that Hashem understands our thoughts as we think them. As I stand there in Shemon Esrei, I don't need to speak out my words for Hashem to hear them. Hashem peers into the essence of me like reading a book. We say that last pasuk, let the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart find favor in your, in front of you. The thoughts of my heart are fully revealed to Hashem. I don't need to speak out my words for Hashem to hear them. I speak out my words to the koach of tefillah, have the impact, have the effect, but Hashem reads through me like a book because Hashem is the creator maintainer of everything. You see, because before Hashem created everything, there was nothing. No time, no matter, no energy, no concepts, no ideas, no thoughts, no configurations, no conceptions. And when Hashem gave man this ability to think, it's not just a gift given to man, but it's a gift that's given and maintained. And as I'm thinking those thoughts, Hashem maintains my brain and my cognition, my thinking. Hashem doesn't just maintain my physical body. Hashem maintains my neshama. And all of the thinking that I do is in God's platform. And because of that, Hashem sees right through me like a book. Hashem knows exactly what I'm thinking, when I'm thinking them. Because Hashem is the creator and keeper of everything. But back to our very, very significant point, and that is that everything before it was created didn't exist. That means everything, anything you've ever seen, any thought you've ever had, anything you've ever experienced didn't exist. Hashem was complete. 
Hashem was Sholem, and before these things existed, Hashem existed, and Hashem created time, space, manner, and energy. And when you understand that, you also understand another very important Yesod. And we discussed last week that Hashem is the Mokom, Hashem is the place, because Hashem is the Mishav, Hashem is the one who keeps everything in existence. But it's really more than that. And Hashem is everywhere at every time, because Hashem isn't limited by any space or place. Because place, space, are only things that Hashem created. So for instance, I can only be in one place at one time. I can be in Chicago or L.A., Argentina or France, but I can't be in two places at one time because I am a physical body limited by physical limitations, and a physical body has a place in existence, one place only. But Hashem isn't limited by place. Hashem is the creator and maintainer of everything, limitless, boundless, before there was place, before there was time, before there was matter, before the energy, Hashem existed. And if that's difficult to understand, I think we can make it a lot easier with a very simple observation. Imagine the following. Imagine that before creation, on the second day, before Hashem made Shemayim Va'aretz, Hashem made the Malachim, and imagine that the, Shem, the Malachim were having a conversation. And one Malach says to his friend, Do you know, I heard that the next few days, Hashem is going to make an entire physical world. There's going to be a third day, a fourth day, a fifth day, and Hashem is going to make a whole physical world. And his Malach friend says, well, what, what, What's in this physical world? Oh, there's going to be birds and flowers, trees, oceans, animals, some big, some large. I even heard Hashem is going to make this behemoth, this, this elephant, a huge, huge behemoth. And the other Malach says, hmm, this thing you called an elephant, how, he- how heavy is it? How heavy is this elephant? Now, and that conversation never happened. Why? Because you see, weight is a measure that's relevant to a physical world. Before Hashem created the physical world, there was no physicality. Therefore, weight is irrelevant. You can't use a scale of measure when there's nothing to measure. So weight did not exist. So too, and these malachim would not be having a discussion about how tall the giraffes are. Why? Because short or long only exists when there's a physical world to measure. Inches, feet are ways of measuring physical entities. Before there was anything physical, and there was no system of measure to measure it with, because there was nothing to measure. As there was no weight, as there was no height, I'd like to share with you one more very, very key observation. What the Surno is teaching us is a fundamental yesod, and that is before Hashem created the physical world, there was no time. Why? Because everything physical has a beginning and has an end. The physical world by its very nature is temporary, and therefore time is relevant in that world. Everything in the world that we live in has a half-life, and a shelf life. Milk tends to spoil at room temperature within 24 hours. Cut flowers last about a week, then they wilt. Don't take prescription drugs after the expiration date because chemicals have a half life. Everything in the physical world <clears throat> is measured by its existence, and time is a very relevant world in a world that's constantly changing, in a world that's constantly decaying. But before Hashem created the physical world, there was no such thing called change. Malachim are. Every malach in existence is. Chazal tell us it's the human being alone. In all of creation, the human being alone is the entity who can grow, who can change. A malach, as great as a malach is, is static. He cannot change. If he's great on this level, great on that level, that's the way Hashem made him. And the human being and the human being alone is able to change. Hence, Chazal tell us human beings are capable of being greater than Malachim. We won't necessarily be that way. It depends on what we do. But the human being has that capacity to be greater than Malachim. But here's the point. In the physical world we live in, we're very accustomed to change. <clears throat> we're very accustomed to the passing of time. But before Hashem created physicality, <clears throat> there was nothing physical So there was no system of time to measure the passing of time because time wasn't relevant. Everything in the spiritual world exists. It is. It doesn't have a half-life, doesn't have a shelf-life, 
and doesn't decay, doesn't change, it just is. And in that world, time isn't a system of measure, it has no relevance. And Betchila Sazman, Bereshis, in the very first moment of time, when Hashem created the physical world, Hashem created a measurement system called time. When Hashem made energy, matter, Hashem also made time, which is the measure of passing in a physical world. And what the Surna is teaching us is a fundamental concept, that that which we take for given isn't so simple. We're very, very comfortable living in a linear world. Yesterday, tomorrow, the next day, a year ago, a week ago, everything passes in a straight, linear fashion. And that's true because right now we are living in this physical world. But here's really the point. Hashem is not limited by our limitations. And before Hashem created anything in the physical world, Hashem was complete. And what that means is, Hashem isn't limited by time. Hashem always was and always will be. Because Hashem isn't based on physicality. Long before there was anything physical, Hashem existed. Hashem from nothing created everything, but that means Hashem is not dependent on that. Before those things existed, Hashem existed, and therefore Hashem is not measured by time, not controlled by time. Hashem always was and always will be. And really a much clearer way of saying it is, Hashem sits well above time. And if this sounds very philosophical and not relevant, let me share with you, it's very, very relevant. Let's first deal with a very basic question that requires understanding. Many people are troubled by the following question. Hashem knows the future. Hashem knows what I'm going to do. Hashem knows what I'm going to do tomorrow, next Tuesday, next Wednesday. Hashem knows exactly what I'm going to do. So, if Hashem knows exactly what I'm going to do, how could I have free will to do it? Meaning, if Hashem knows that next Tuesday I'm going to do X, then Hashem knows it, so I don't have free will to do it. And LMI, I do have free will, then how could Hashem know that I'm going to do it? Because I have free will to do it or not do it. How is it possible for Hashem to know the future and me to have free will? If I have free will, it means I could do it or could not do it, so how could Hashem know? And if Hashem knows, that means I don't have free will. Free will and Yediyas Hashem on the future sound like an impossible contradiction. But if you think about these concepts we've dealt with now, you'll see it's not a contradiction at all. And let's do the first step answering this. Redvirot's Roshiva Rochester gave a beautiful muscle. <clears throat> Imagine the following. Imagine that you and I get into a time machine and we travel five years forward and we step out of this time machine and we see Ruvain holding a gun to Shimon's head. And Ruvain says, You stop, don't do it, Ruvain. You and I scream, Don't do it, don't. Ruvain says, I'm going to do it, I don't care. Blah, 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 blah. He shoots Shimon dead and Shimon falls in a puddle of blood, dead as a doornail. We witnessed Ritzicha. We watched Ruvain kill Shimon. We get back into our time machine, come back to the present day, and we go over to Ruvain. Ruvain, I know factually, 100%, five years from now you're going to kill Shimon. How could you know that? I didn't do it. I know it because I saw it. What do you mean you saw it? I didn't do it. The answer is because I have a traveling time machine. I could travel back and forth. So I could see what you did and I could come back and know what you did before you did it because I saw it in the future, because I'm not subject to time. I'm not limited to time. That's a way on some level of understanding Hashem's relationship to time, but really it's far more fundamental. Hashem sits leagues and leagues, miles and miles above time. You see, in our time machine, I could go forward, see you do something and come back, and now, five years earlier, I know factually what you're going to do because I went forward and came back. But Hashem doesn't go forward and come back. Hashem is not limited by time. Hashem was, is, and will be. And Hashem sits in all places of time at any moment. Hashem is everywhere at all times, not just physically, not just in terms of placement, not just in terms of being the makom, but in terms of time. Malchuscha, malchus kol olamim, your rulership is in every generation, but every generation simultaneously. Hashem sits above the earth, not subject to time, not limited, sees the future at the same moment as the past, and lives in all of these moments at the same time. Now, to be very honest with you, I hope by now your head is spinning. 
And I hope you're saying, this sounds interesting, but what has it got to do with me? So let me share with you that this has a lot to do with us. First of all, again, knowing these answers, at least on some level, is important because it allows us to step away from our limited thinking, our limited understanding. But there is ultimately one big lesson to learn from that. And let me begin this lesson with an interesting question. Here's the question. The Rambam was very smart, very, very smart. Shlomo Melech was even smarter, way, way smarter. So if the Rambam was very, very smart, and Shlomo Melech was even smarter, so Hashem must be very, 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 very smart, right? Wrong. If I ask you what is Hashem's IQ, what I'm asking with that question is the foolish mistake that we human beings always make. It's called anthropomorphism. We attribute human attributes to God. If I ask what's Hashem's IQ, how smart is Hashem, I'm so limiting the creator of the heavens and earth that it's ludicrous. You can't measure Hashem's intelligence. Hashem knows everything all the time at every moment. Within your mind, as you're thinking the thoughts, Hashem is right there. Within my mind, as I'm thinking the thoughts, Hashem is right here. Hashem is there. Hashem is everywhere. If you'd like a seer, just an illustration of what this means, imagine you're dominating Shemar Esri, speaking to Hashem right there. And you're fully aware that Hashem knows my past and knows my future, and knows my family, knows my relationships, knows if this happens, then this affects this one, that one, this one. But as I'm speaking to Hashem, my na- neighbor next to me is speaking to Hashem. And there's a guy down the road, and the guy, you know, 200 men in the room dominating to Hashem at the same time. And Hashem hears all their conversations, knows all of their thoughts, all of their history, and knows everything at the same time. In my house, we have a rule. And the girls multitask, the boys don't. One of my sons had a good line, multitask, I can't even task. Now, I don't know if human beings can multitask, because the truth be told, we human beings have very, very limited focus. But I want to give you a challenge. Here's my challenge. Truly multitask. I want you to think about two things at the very same time. I want you to think about two things and hold those two thoughts in your mind at the same time, and I guarantee you're not going to be too successful. As a matter of fact, I'll share with you a little uh, public health information. If you have trouble falling asleep, I have an exercise that's very, very helpful. It's an old Chinese exercise. You imagine two points in your mind and just make the two points go further apart, further apart, further apart, further apart, further apart, further apart, and if you just keep the points moving, 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 you'll fall asleep. Normally, you're not falling asleep because your mind is racing, thinking, but if you train your mind to see the spots and just move them apart, 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 eventually you'll fall asleep. Why? Because you can't keep two thoughts in your mind at one time. And if you're visualizing those spots, your full focus is on those spots, and you can't think other thoughts at the same time because you are a human being, limited. We human beings can think one thought at one time. But Hashem hears 200 conversations at one time. But it's not just this shul. And many shuls in a city, many cities in this country, many countries in this world. Six and a half billion people on the planet, Hashem intimately involved in every one of their lives, knowing everything that happens involved knowing everything that's going to affect another human being, another person, all simultaneously. What is Hashem's IQ? Don't even ask the question. But here's the point. The next time you have a little bit of tsaras in your life, a little bit of trouble, a little bit of worry, and you say, Hashem, why? 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 Hashem, I can't understand your ways. Hashem, why would you do Hashem, I don't understand you. And then you come to the kasha. Hashem, were you angry at me? You, you, tell you, Hashem, why? That's when it's very, very important to remember the two rules of bitachon. And the focus of tonight is not bitachon, but the Chavos of Ovos tells us there are two things that I have to know for bitachon. Number one, Hashem loves me more than I love me. That one's not so hard. It's a second one that's far more difficult. Hashem knows better than I what's for my best. But it's not that Hashem is a little bit smarter than me. Not that Hashem is like, you know, kind of like a gifted uh, IQ or like a very, very gifted and profoundly gifted. Hashem's understanding is so beyond our capacity to understand. 
before and after at the same time. And this generation and the next generation throughout the cosmos, Hashem is present in every moment of time and every place in time, knowing every thought, knowing everything simultaneously. And that should bring me to a very simple reality. I am the creation. God, I trust your ways. And you know better than I what I need. You're far wiser than I, but not far wiser. You're so beyond my capacity to relate, to think, to even begin to think about understanding that I don't question your ways. I dutifully follow. I trust in your ways. I know you love me more than I love me. And I know you know far better than I what's for my best. But you see, when you delve into these ideas, Hashem is present at all times, in all places, knows everyone's thoughts, and simultaneously hearing 200 people's conversations and knowing they're in... You recognize we're not dealing with a very smart human being, not the Rambam, not Shlomo Melech on steroids. We're dealing with something so beyond our capacity to even relate to. And again, that's very important because it allows us on some level to begin to trust our Creator. But I believe that there's an even bigger application of knowing these concepts that apply to us right now in a very real way. As we approach the Yomim Noraim, there are many people who get this sort of uh, black, despondent sense, of fear of judgment, the Shem is going to punish me, going to hit me, my and they start quaking. Now, it is a very wise person who prepares for the Yom Adin, and a very f- wise person who awakens within himself the yira, the recognition that Hashem is the shofet, Hashem is the judge, my future, the future of my family, the future of my community is on the line. But there, is never sh- there never should be a sense of despondence, black depression, fear. Gilu bira'adda. And you're supposed to be trembling with tremendous joy. Why? Because when you understand Hashem's relationship to creation, and when you understand Hashem's relationship to us, the more you recognize Hashem, the more you recognize Hashem's mastery, the more you recognize Hashem's power, the more filled with joy you are, the more filled with trust you are, the more filled with hope. But because this is often a very difficult point, let me share with you a conversation that I once had with a woman when we discussed these concepts. I was once talking about Amuna. And I mentioned the third level of Amuna is knowing that Hashem knows my thoughts as I'm thinking them. Okay, and this was a speech somewhere in an out-of-town community. And when I was finished, people came over to ask questions. And a woman came over distraught. That's terrible. That's horrible. Hashem knows my thoughts as I'm thinking. That's terrible, Rabbi. It's terrible. Ter-. I didn't know what was troubling her, but it certainly didn't make sense. And after a while, her husband explained to me, and what was going on. She had been, she was a Balas Tshuva, and her father was an abusive individual, and she was always very, very nervous. An idea that Hashem knows her inner thought means Hashem is so close, she was too vulnerable, and, 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 and Hashem knows, is that close to me, too intimate, and too vulnerable, and she was just very uncomfortable with that. So I'd like to share with you the three questions that I shared with her. And I said, if you think about these three questions, I think you'll see there's not much to be afraid of. Here's question number one. Question number one is like this. And before you were created, what great deed did you do that Hashem said, oh, that person I'm going to create? Right? Before you were created, what great thing did you do that Hashem said, oh, a person as great as that, it's worthy for me to create? The answer to that question is, before you were created, you didn't exist, which means you didn't do anything. And that is the very first concept you have to understand. Before you were created, you didn't exist. And the reason Hashem created you is not because you're great, not because you're worthy, not because of anything you could do or would do. Hashem needs nothing from you. If you spent your whole life trying to do everything Hashem wanted, you would give Hashem nothing because Hashem needs nothing. Hashem created you for one reason and one reason only. Hashem is the mativ. Hashem is the giver. Hashem wanted a share of His good with others, and He created you for one reason and one reason only, to share of His good with you. Nothing you're going to do in life will ever pay back Hashem for what He did for you. Nothing you could do would ever pay back. But more than anything, Hashem did not create you because you're worthy. Hashem does not keep you in existence because you're worthy. 
Hashem created you and keeps you in existence for one reason, because Hashem wants to share of His good with you. Okay, let's move on, I said. Let's move on to question number two. Question number two is, <clears throat> what could you do to make Hashem angry? All right, let's say you get fed up. Hashem, I've had it. I've had I'm sick and tired. I'm going to get you mad. Uh, says Bori, I'm going to get you angry, God. Let's say you make it your vendetta to make God angry. What act, what thing, what could you do to make God really, really angry? So I said, I'd like to share with you nothing for two reasons. Number one, with all due respect, you're just not important enough. If you understand that there are a hundred billion galaxies, each containing a hundred billion stars, within some galaxy somewhere called the Milky Way galaxy, somewhere, somewhere there's this planet Earth, occupied by seven and a half billion people, and somewhere, somewhere in there is you, but God occupies every part of the existence. You recognize that your relationship to God is not exactly equals. See, if we're equals and I do something, I'll get you angry, you get me angry, because we're, we're combatants, we're, we're peers, we're, you know. <clears throat> but we're not exactly peers to God. Hashem is so much bigger. There's nothing you could ever do to make God angry. I don't even know, Moshe, do you get angry? A two-year-old threatens you to a fistfight. Oh, I'm going to beat you up. I'm going to get angry. How dare you threaten me? <clears throat> it's childish. It's, you're not important enough to make God angry. But much more than that, the concept is anthropomorphic. God doesn't have midos. <clears throat> midos, character traits, are human limitations that God created. Before there was anger, before there was jealousy, before there was ego, Hashem existed. Hashem is not limited by space, time, or human traits. I get you angry. He made me so angry. And I lost my temper. I couldn't help myself. Those are human conditions, human traits. They don't apply to God. Whenever you read in the Torah, Charon Af, Hashem created and runs the world in a particular way. Hashem wants it to be Sarv Onish. Hashem wants it to be corrections along the way to put us on the right spot. And Hashem wants it to be, again, reward and punishments. But it's never that Hashem is angry. Hashem acts Becharon Af, but it's like a outside thing that Hashem is wearing. Hashem is acting in that way. If you'd like to know what you could do to make Hashem really angry, the answer is nothing. All that Hashem wants is your benefit. All that Hashem wants is for you to grow. But let's come to question number three, because this is a critical one. How much patience does Hashem have? I was a high school rabbi. If you teach high school boys, you better have a lot of, I mean, a lot, a lot of patience. So some people have a lot of patience. Some people have a little patience. Some people have a lot, a lot of, how much patience does God have? Good question, right? The answer is God doesn't have any patience because patience is a human limitation. I have some, you have more, this one has more, <clears throat> but that means you got me agitated, I lost my pay. The concept doesn't apply to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Hashem acts with Midos, <clears throat> runs the world in a certain way for our benefit to help us. And if Hashem acts with anger, it's for one reason, to put us back on the right path, to strain us out maybe to pay us back for the things we did wrong so that we don't have to live with them for eternity so we can leave this earth clean. But never does Hashem get angry, never does Hashem lose patience, and never does Hashem look at you and say, you're not worthy anymore. Oh, you used to be, I, I, you used to be worthy. <clears throat> Before I created you, you were worthy of my creating. But now after what you've done, you're no longer worthy. Those concepts are foolish. Before you created, there was nothing you did. You weren't worthy to be created then. You're not worthy to be created now. Hashem created you for one reason, because Hashem wants your benefit. Hashem wants to shower you with good. Hashem doesn't get angry. Angry doesn't apply. Patience doesn't apply. All that Hashem wants is one thing, for you to grow, for you to accomplish, for you to change, for you to become the great human being you can be. And as you approach Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, as you approach life, you're supposed to understand one thing. As much as I want my betterment, as much as I want everything good, Hashem wants it even more. As much as I want a beautiful life, Hashem wants it way more. The Chovah Zavava says, if you want to understand Hashem's relationship to us, and take the most kindly, loving, giving person you could ever imagine. Take Avram Avinu, unbridled love, giving kindness to anyone, and runs, bows down full face in the sand to three Arabs, come in and eat my food. Take that unbridled love 
multiply it 10,000, 10,000, 10,000 times, and you don't even have an inkling for the giving of Hashem to the world. Hashem is limitless and boundless, and all Hashem wants is our benefit. Hashem created the entire cosmos, everything in creation for us, for us to grow, for us to accomplish, not because we're worthy, not because we're good, not because we're deservant. I'm deservant of nothing. Before I existed, I didn't exist. I didn't do anything to make it worthy for Hashem to exist, to make me exist. And when I exist, there's nothing I could do to pay back Hashem. Hashem keeps me alive with one thing only, chesed, grace. Hashem is the giver, Hashem is the native, Hashem wants me to succeed, Hashem doesn't get angry, Hashem doesn't lose patience. And the more I understand that, the more as I get closer to Hashem, and I recognize that Hashem is the shofate, I recognize, yes, it's a very grave and serious thing we're going to stand on Rosh Hashanah. I'm going to be judged, and the judgment is across the gamut. Every human being on the planet, every issue of the coming year is decided. The stakes are high, but I have one ace in the hole. It's my God, my Creator, Avinu Makenu, who is the Shofet, the one who loves me more than I love me, the one who doesn't lose patience, the one who doesn't get angry. And all He wants is one thing, for me to grow, for me to change, for me to do tshuva. Let's go! The more I get it, the more I see the gravity, the more I recognize the Shofet is my, I can't say my best friend, more than my best friend, my beloved, my, my Hashem, God, who loves me, who only wants everything for me, who created me just to give to me and who waits patiently, with infinite patience, for me to finally wake up. Dread, despondent, depression, those words have no connection to the Avoda. The main Avoda on Rosh Hashanah is to get one concept. God is present, God is in charge. It's real. God really created the world, God really maintains the world, and God really orchestrates every activity under the sun. That's the Avoda on Rosh Hashanah to get it and to understand it, but that fills a person with joy. Why? Because yes, it's a serious issue, but I got my best friend, my creator, God himself is the one who's the judge. I'm vested here. I'm, I'm a shoe in if I could just wake up. And my friends, this concept is profound because what we really ask for on Yom Kippur is one thing and one thing only. Slicha and Mechila. Let's say I use the Yom Naroim properly, and I wake up on Rosh Hashanah, and I get it, Hashem is really in charge. Hashem is really the judge, and every activity under the sun, the entire coming year is being weighed, measured, and decided. And God will decree exactly what will be. So I get it, and I realize it, and I realize my fate, my family's fate, my community's fate is on the chopping blocks right now. The question is open an open book. If I come to that recognition, and then I get close to Yom Kippur, and I focus on one thing. I am not coming to my Creator and saying, I am deservant. Hashem, I am a tzaddik. Hashem, I am pure. You should give me life, health, well-being, parnasa, because I'm a great person and deservant. I didn't deserve being created. I don't deserve being in existence now. I don't claim to have been done anything. I'm asking for one thing and one thing only. Slich mechila. I'm saying to Hashem, it's in your best interest, because what do you want? You only want one thing, my growth. And I'm headed upwards. I'm going to change. I'm going to grow. I'm going to take on a different way. I'm going to take on things. I'm going to be a different human being. Please forgive me. Not please forgive me because I'm great. Not please forgive me because I'm worthy. Not even please forgive me in the schus avos. And please forgive me because you are the av harachamim. Please forgive me because, again, hopefully it's in your best interest, because all you want is my betterment. All you want is for me to grow. And here's my plan. I'm going to change. I'm going to grow. I'm going to learn. I'm going to dive. I'm going to work on my media. This, um, this is my plan. And don't you see, if you give me life, if you give me health, if you give me parnasa, I'll be able to better serve you, to do what you want, namely to get closer to you and to recognize your sovereignty to a greater extent. And with that tefillah, Hashem is, welcomes us with open arms because ultimately that's all that Hashem wants. I think these concepts are fundamental and eye-opening. And what the Surno shares with us is a basic concept. Bereshis bara elokim. In the Tchilas Azman, at the very first moment of time, Hashem created Shemayim Arts, because before Hashem created Shemayim Arts, there was no time. Because time is a measure of physicality. 
If we had two malachim having a conversation before Hashem created the physical world, and they would discuss the elephants, they couldn't ask what do the elephants weigh, because weight is a measure of a physical dimension. Before Hashem created matter, there was no measuring of matter. Weight didn't exist. They couldn't discuss how tall the giraffes would be, because before Hashem created anything, there was nothing to measure. As weight, as height, are measures of physical properties, so to is time. The world we live in is a changing world. We forget the ashiras, the wealth of being alive. And we forget that everything else in existence is static, cannot change. Whatever level they're on, it's, that's it. And by the way, there will come a time for us where we too will be static. When it's over, curtain comes down, my body's put in the ground, boom. Where I am is where I am. But until that time, I can change, I can grow. And we become so accustomed to this physical world that we forget the incredible opportunity of change, of growth. In a spiritual world, there is no change. Things are. It's only in a physical world, everything has a half-life, everything is decaying or growing, everything is constantly changing. In that world, time has a measurement. And again, when you understand that, you understand a few basics. Number one, before Hashem created you, you didn't exist. And that means you are a creation, not a creator. And your relationship to your creator is a creation. And dependent upon, kept in existence by your creator. And much like I to the dream, I'm the dreamer as long as I think about the seagull, the seagull exists. <clears throat> I to a Baruch Hu, as long as Hashem thinks about me, as long as Hashem infuses energy into me, I exist as every other element in existence. Because Hashem is the dreamer. And when you understand that, you also understand that my thoughts are clear and obvious to Hashem. I don't have to speak out my thoughts. Hashem hears my thoughts. Why? Because I think in the platform of God. Much like I to the seagull. The seagull says, thinks to himself, I want to fly west. He can only think to himself, I want to fly west, if I let him think. I created his brain. I created his thoughts. The script there is me writing it, keeping it. Now, Hashem created this entity called free will, which we'll discuss in a future session, which is very, very difficult to understand. But even a separate das, even an independent will, is only kept in existence by Hashem, because before Hashem created anything, there was nothing. No matter, no time, no space, no cognitions, no thoughts, and nothing existed. Hashem existed with the absence of anything, and therefore Hashem is not dependent on anything. Hashem is in all places at all times, and Hashem is not limited by physicality. Hashem is in all places at all times because Hashem isn't limited by time. Last year, next year, Hashem is in the time at all times. Therefore, Hashem knows what I'm going to do before I do it. I still have free will because Hashem, much like that time machine, but much more than a time machine because Hashem is leagues above. And again, while these concepts are very lofty and very difficult to really feel, they're very important because more than anything, it allows me to understand my relationship to my Creator. Number one, I and God are not equals. We're not bar pluktas. It's not like Hashem thinks this way and I think that way, and let's, let's fight it out. Hashem, I, I think I got it right. No, you got it right. You know, we're not exactly in the same league. And the next time you find yourself angry at Hashem, Hashem, why? Why, 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 why? And you put down the whys and you say, I get it. Hashem loves me more than I love me, and Hashem knows better than I what's my best. But not a little bit better. Not a lot of it better, not like the Rambam, not like Shlomo Melech, like the creator of the heavens and earth who knows everything at all times. His brain, my brain, the other brain, 200 brain, seven and a half billion people's brain, beyond any human capacity. And again, when you understand this, there's no fear of judgment, because you know that everything is kept in existence by Hashem. Hashem is the Shofet, and more than anything, you know that Hashem loves me. And that woman had a great fear of knowing that Hashem knows her thoughts, because she thought she had to be worthy and she felt uncomfortable with Hashem being close. And I understand before I was created, I did nothing to make myself worthy. After I was created, I did nothing to make myself worthy of being in creation. Hashem created me for one reason, to share of His good with me. Hashem only wants my best. Hashem wants me to grow. Hashem has no limit of cold patience. Doesn't get angry. And I'd like to close with one last final observation. And let's go back to that moshul because it is very helpful to understanding Hashem's relationship to physicality. Imagine that I say to the seagull, now seagull, listen to me very, very carefully. Yeah, I want you to fly east because, 
I told you last week, if you fly west, there are dangerous birds. There are falcons. There are hawks. They're going to eat you. Fly east, you'll be safe. Fly west, and you're going to be in big, big danger. What does the seagull do? The seagull says, I don't care. I'm flying west. Mr. Seagull, I'm warning you. I don't care. I'm warning you. Now, again, I'm fully aware of his thoughts. <clears throat> he only exists because I keep him in existence. And he can only fly the other way because I will it to be that he can fly and flap his wings and so I have to support him and help him. All right, Mr. Seagull, you want to go west? Go for it, guy. He flaps and flaps and flaps. <clears throat> as he passes the coast, he's out there in the ocean. He's happy as a seagull, <clears throat> flapping away, when all of a sudden he looks up and he sees a falcon. The falcon clips his wings, does a dive at 200 miles an hour, and the seagull looks up to me, the dreamer, and says, Help! Help! The dangerous hawk! He's going to kill me! Now here's the point. The hawk only exists because I created the hawk and I maintain the hawk. And I control every flap of the hawk's wings. And if in fact I decide that the seagull is toast, the hawk will get him and it's over. If I decide the seagull just needs a little bit of a scare, I'm going to bring the hawk very close, very close, very up. sorry, just missed, and the seagull will fly away. And when you understand that, you understand our relationship to our Creator. Nothing under the sun happens without Hashem being involved in everything of it. Because Hashem is not the Creator alone. Hashem is the Creator, Maintainer, and Orchestrator of everything. There's nothing that could exist without Hashem keeping in existence. Nothing that could happen without Hashem willing it to be. Because Hashem is everywhere. And when I violate Hashem's will, and I'm roi for punishment, and I have, and I've done it, and I know it, and I say to Hashem, I'm in big trouble because I see it. I'm being chased. I'm being hounded, and I get it. It's my sins. And I really even can't promise I'm going to stop. I even can't promise I'm going to change. I'll try. I wish I would, but I can't. At that moment, I could turn to my Creator and say one thing, Hashem, please have mercy. And <clears throat> Please have mercy. Save me. I know it's all in your control. Hawks, bullets, financial crises, nothing can touch me. Everything is you. And even if I did everything wrong, it's you who bring the punishment. You who bring the hawk. And you who control every activity under the sun. Hashem, please have Rachmanus. And when I say those words, you know what happens to me? I change. I finally get it. I might only get it in desperation. I might only get it when the creditors are going to shut me down. I might only get it when the hawk is about to clamp his jaws on me. But at that moment, I get it. My Creator created and runs the world. My Creator is in charge. And that is the greatest transcendence that a human being can accomplish. And when you say those words, you beg Hashem for Rachamim, you recognize Hashem's Midos, you recognize Hashem is the native, you recognize Hashem is in charge, and you've changed, you've become a new man. It may be true, you may still do a very X, Y, and Z. I can't say, Hashem, I'm going to be told about you. I wish I could, but I can't say that. But I could say, I now understand things differently, and that and that alone might be the reason why you're worthy to be saved. It requires a lot of thinking, a lot of contemplation, a lot of walking, and just clearing your mind and thinking about these thoughts. And when you do, you have a totally different understanding of life, of Hashem, our relationship to Hashem, and what our actions do. Okay, and with that, I'd like to now open the floor to questions, thoughts, and observations. If you have any questions on uh, this shear, this material, or <coughs> other questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, you could type it into the uh, into the Q and A if you like. Uh, you don't if you're not if you're shy, you can take a moment to think about questions. Um, if you don't have questions, it's also fine. Again, I just want to mention that if you have if you're not getting the uh, daily chizik, we have a WhatsApp group where you'll get actually I don't know if it's daily, but every two or three days we send out these short clips, <coughs> short videos, great chizik. Uh, if you'd like to join, just go to theshmooz.com. You'll see a button. You just click it, and it'll put you into the WhatsApp group. And you can also get the ten really dumb mistakes that very small couples make there. If you have any questions, please feel free to type it in. Uh, if you don't have questions, I've exhausted my voice already anyway. Uh, so I'll be fine with that. Um, I do uh, tomorrow night in Mitzvah Shem, I'll be in Monmouth, uh, in the Monmouth Torah Center. If anyone would like information, please send me an email. I'll send you an address. I'm speaking at 7 o'clock there. <clears throat> if you're there in that part of the world, I'd love to see you. If not, <clears throat> Mitzvah Shem, we'll see you next week. I hope you found this meaningful, and I hope you have a good week and a good Shabbos. Thank you.